excited. Uh, hey, everybody out there. My name is Chris Albrecht. I'm out of focus. I, this My webcam does that. Let's see if it'll focus. There we go. Ooh, nice. uh, my name is Chris Albrecht. I'm with Open Water, and I am oh, thrilled to be with my guests today. Uh, I've told Connor this before, but I think outside of my wife, this is the longest relationship I've had with an entity <laughs> because I have been listening to their podcast since I think 2006. I'm not making that up. You started it around then, right? 2005. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 2005. 2005. I started in 2006. I'm talking about the iFanboy podcast. The one of just, you know what? I'm not even going to say it's like the best comic, podcast, even though it is, but it is one of the best podcasts um, that I have literally been listening to every week uh, for almost 10, uh, 20 years now. That's insane. <laughs> I am thrilled to have uh, the co hosts and founders of the Great North Media uh, and co hosts of the iFanboy podcast, Connor Kilpatrick and Josh Flanagan. We're here today to talk about how to make a podcast. Welcome to the show, fellas. Thanks for having Howdy. us, Chris. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to open it up. I'll start with Connor because I know he is the data guy. So uh, I just want to sort of set the stage as to why I asked you both to be here with just sort of some of the bona fides. I know that how many podcasts have you produced? You've been doing it continuously since 2005. I assume you, you know, as, as specific as you can get, like, give us a little bit about the show you both run uh, and how long it's been. And Sure. Um, so in 2005, Josh and our third partner, Ron Richards, who is no longer actively on the show, although he's on our other show, he's part of, still part of Great Northern Media. Um, we started I, I, producing a weekly podcast called Pick of the, I Fanboy Pick of the Week. It was in conjunction with our website at the time called ifanboy.com, where we talked about comic books. We had a pick of the week every week. Um that grew and grew and grew. We were very early in podcasts and we started late 2005. And um, eventually we added a whole suite of family of shows. We have different kinds of shows or different kinds of subjects. We still do the pick of the week show every week. We're on episode two, 922. Two, as I can't see three, my calendar two. from here. Two, I think. Let me. We be... do three tomorrow night. 923 is this week's show. Um, and then uh, we have a monthly, we have several monthly shows that were unlocked by our patrons. We have a uh, sh sh bi-weekly show where Josh interviews comic creators. We have a bi-weekly show where Josh and I will review a graphic novel. We have a monthly show that we do with Ron where we talk about non-comics media. We cover movies when they come out. We occasionally will cover animated uh, content that comes out. Uh, we have a whole slate of shows. We always do at least six shows a month, but it can be as many as eight. Um, I think one crazy month we had 10. But uh, yeah, and at one point we were doing it full time and we were doing a video show as well. We had seven shows a week at that point. <laughs> Which and was, uh, we were in our twenties. We had the energy for that. Um, so it's been a lot. I'm, I'm actually looking uh, up for you right now how many total shows we have put out, and I can tell you we've done 1,365 audio shows that are on our feed, but that doesn't count the 50 make comic shows you did, Josh, because they're not in the yeah. feed. So that's that would be um 14. I do math bad. 1,400. He shows. really is into the numbers. He wants to give. He, I would have rounded by now and moved on. <laughs> So we have 1,365 uh, shows on our, on our feed currently. You can go listen to it at fanboy.com. Well, the reason it'd I be, wanted you both 1,415, here, right? by the way. <laughs> I'm bad at math. I told you. Aside from having a stellar podcast, I encourage everybody to find it as plug in iFanboy, whether or not you read comics. I don't even read the comics that they talk about, and it's an entertaining show every week, um, <laughs> especially if it has to fly solo. Um, uh, <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry, um, you're caught up. But the uh, one of the one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here is not just because of the length of time you've done it, but you've done it prior to like podcasting becoming. You've been through the evolution of it, right? And you've also done it. You weren't spun off from like NPR. You weren't a celebrity who got into it, right? Like you've built your audience over the years. And I think that's really important because you started from scratch and really you've done everything. And we're going to kind of talk about that today, whether it's you run ads, you do Patreon, you were acquired at one point, you've been through it all. So you can really tell a story, I think, about how to podcast in a way no one else can. Um, and I'm going to kind of flip this. Normally, when people interview other people, they say, hey, what's the one bit of advice that you would give to people as, as sort of the last question? And Josh, I want to flip that a little bit and just let's just front load that right now. For people who are thinking of starting a podcast, right? Like they're listening to them, they enjoy them, they can go with them or whatever. What do you think is the one thing they should consider before starting a podcast? Oh, one thing... I guess if I had to narrow it down to like one thing is that I think you need to have a point of view uh, that is sort of specific to you that um, 
in the case of kind of what we do and and a, and a you know sort of an opinion that is gonna en- engage people in a way that you're not seeing in other things and and i know that that's sort of vague but there are like if we had launched our podcast three or four years later than we did it would have been hard to stand out so we had a chance to sort of develop that like what's our voice what's our point of view what do we want to go for and i know that i don't know the people listening you know read comics or whatever but there are one million five hundred sixty three billion shows <laughs> that are like i'm a geek talking about geek stuff um and it's in that case, it's a lot of people who, who like want to say something and have an opinion, but they haven't really zoomed in. So we got lucky because we had this website where we would do the literal pick of the week. Every week, one of us would write a thousand words on a comic book. So when we started the show, we had a format. We had a framework to be in. And then we also had time to sort of develop what it was going to be. Like we have pretty strict, I don't know, not rules, but we have a format that we stick to. And we sort of have rules of like, we very early on decided like when we talk about comic books we were going to talk about what was good about them and what was bad about them but whenever we criticize something like there has to be a reason for it so at the same time we had to teach ourselves to be comic book experts in a way you know like of the craft of the form and i know that's something we've really leaned in, leaned into and we don't like if we make criticisms we back them up we don't say i don't like this it but sucks. having you... the point of view is the is the main <laughs> Yeah, piece of advice because as Josh said, there's a million shows, and you have to s- slice further and further. Um, as as new shows come out, you can't just be a general show. You have to you have to have your slice of of expertise be very thin at this point. Um, so the the main thing is, and also if you're going to do it, you got to be really passionate about it, and and want to spend a lot of time doing it. So it's got to be something you really like talking about, right? You can't be sitting <laughs> yeah. there. I'm kind of into comics. So I'll do this comics podcast. It's like. You're gonna the amount of time dedicated you, to doing it. You're gonna have to really want to spend a lot of time doing it. I think I was getting at that in, in terms of like, don't pick a thing and go. This is popular. I'll talk about this. Like, it helped that we were very passionate about it. It was a big part of the linchpin of the friendship that we had existed already. And you know, we I think we got a little lucky in that like all three of us had degrees in production, which are completely anachronistic now. But we sort of knew where we were starting from and how to kind of produce a show. Um, so even if you don't have that, you should be thoughtful about it, like what it is, you know, the day of turn on a mic and ramble about something, if you are not famous, uh, is going to be pretty hard to get anybody to listen to. But that also depends on what your goal is. Like, is your goal to get people to listen? Is your goal to talk and have your 10 friends listen? And that sort of matters too, I suppose. Yeah, I want to just not to get all Brene Brown on this real quick, but I think that's one of the reasons why I gravitated and continue to listen to your show, because it's not like wallowing in negativity. You really you come with it like we really we love comics. We love talking about it. And it's been interesting to hear you in these later years talk about sort of how much you've learned process of doing this every week and coming with it with like it's a celebration almost at the risk of sounding. It's not like ebullient or whatever but it's just it's it's very much a positive experience and so it's one that you kind of want to return to because you're not like oh it's just people hating on things and i think that's a mm-hmm. really important um lesson it, it, you have to have fun doing it i think um one thing we've heard consistently with low these 20 some odd years of doing the show is that it's fun to listen to because we're having fun doing it i mean mm-hmm. josh and i talk all the time it's our weekly therapy you know, like we get um, an hour plus, you know, the show's about an hour long, but we in the recording at, on the recording where we spent an hour and a half where the two of us are on the recording together. And we come out of it. I come out of it. And Josh does, comes out of it in great moods because it's a lot of fun to talk to your one of your best friends for an hour and make dumb jokes. And um, that, I think, comes through when you, you, you know, the shows that I listen to myself that aren't our shows, because I, I used to only listen to our shows. Um <laughs> they're fun they're fun you can tell people doing we're having a good time and, and, and like each other yeah. and those that's you you kind of want the feeling of wanting to hang out with with your friends now there are other podcasts that are like news shows that are sure very informational and that's a very different vibe but it, the kind of show that we do and the kind of shows that i gravitate to that aren't like true crime or whatever is all about like i'm enjoying listening to these people talk and you know make jokes with each other for but also long. having qualified opinions a lot of times yeah like yeah that, obviously yes, and, yes. and you know like i said we got lucky we had to sort of develop that qualified opinion uh over time uh in the earlier age but we actually had people listening frighteningly quickly i i think we sort of did it as a lark and like you know within a year we're like there are a thousand people listening to this and that was insane um that's 2005 
right? Or 2005, six. 2006, right? Yeah, so that's pre-iPhone. Started, yeah, the very end 2005. By 2006, <laughs> we were on our way. Um, and as Josh said very early on, uh, it, it, we were lucky that when we started, there were approximately five other comic book podcasts. So um, people who were just hearing about podcasts, who, list, who read comics, would go and search comics on iTunes at the time, and they'd find five shows. And then, and those five shows, you know, all sort of grew together at the same time. We, you know, we ended up, you know, knowing all those guys, and some of them are still doing it, some are not. But um, we were lucky. But the point is, when you search comic books on iTunes, uh, we're still the first result. Is there That's the iTunes? important thing. I yeah, know. you got in there. <laughs> Apple Podcasts. <laughs> yeah, someone we once did a convention. You know, did a podcasting panel at a convention, and and uh, it was in San Francisco. And someone asked how, you know, what's our best advice for being successful? And our advice was get a time machine because <laughs> we have, we never did anything to be successful other than try to make a good show every week and be early into the, in, in the game. Now, that's well, irre- irrelevant to this conversation. You can't undersell it to a certain. Like Connor, you said he's the data guy. Like Connor was very much into doing a format. The one thing I can say is that I'm late for every single thing in my life, but we have not failed to put out a show on Sunday. But once. Ever. Did once. we once? That's because I had appendicitis. It was, it once. was I couldn't early. Do that show. No, you were you weren't on that show, but the show still came out uh, early <laughs> on. I think it was episode like nineteen or twenty. Uh, somebody's computer died who had the file, and it took, and that oh. show never that show didn't come out for weeks. That's, so there was one week where we missed it because the show that's file still was that's a pretty out. good record, and you're focusing yeah. on that. No, I'm just saying it happened one time. That's no, but like there is a consistency there, like that routine of the whole thing, and and you know we are devoted to it. It's a huge part of Connor and I have talked about the fact that like pretty much at this point every single good thing in our lives came out of this um you know the people we know relationships we have there have been marriages jobs. yeah jobs i mean i'm talking to chris right now uh he saved my bank in 2010 so uh you know and that was because of the show um so we're devoted to it in that way and, and we also don't know how to live without it which is sounds more serious than it is <laughs> oh. but like we've been we, we started ifan when we were 22 out of college we started the podcast when we were 27 um, I don't know how to live an adult life without it being around making the show. Like, you know, the show and the life have to fit together. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to live without the show being a major factor in how I have to schedule my life. Because I've done that my entire adult life. <laughs> and and, and then the other side of that, though, is that you, if you want to do it and you, you like it a lot, it has to be um, – it has to not be too much. Like, if this yeah. was too much – if the, if all those things we talked about being consistent, being able to fit it in, and we've had to move move things around and, and change it over the years to accommodate for life and children and jobs and things like that. But you know, if it ever becomes too much and you're not having fun, if we weren't having fun, we would pro- we would stop. I think because we have that meeting every December. Are we still having fun? Yeah. Yes. All right. We keep <laughs> doing it. Yes. It was, it's a meeting that lasts three seconds. Well, I want to I want to shift a little bit to a bit more. Sorry, we will, we will ramble no, if you don't if you let us. Listen, so you cu- cut us off. Break <laughs> in when you need to. Uh, I want to remind people in the audience that they can ask questions. Uh, just submit a question through the Q and A button, and I will forward it on. But I want to move from sort of the macro we're talking about sort of the intangible and into the very tactical. On a very basic, what equipment do people need to produce a podcast now? We That's talk the great about thing is that hardly anything, right? That's the great thing about it. But, uh, I would say, you know, well, I mean, you tell me, are, should something, given the rise of like, I see so many podcasts now have a video version on YouTube, right? Where it's, and we mm-hmm. do this here, right? Where it's just, well, I'll just export the file on YouTube because why not? It's another platform. Um, mm-hmm. So I, you know, is it, you know, I'm talking like microphone software, what yeah. kinds of things should people uh, need? I to would have? say it's, it's certainly moving towards a thing where having video would be beneficial, but that does lead a whole other level of sort of complication in production and, you know, just hard drive space. Um, If I had to answer that, um, let's say, for example, that you're just doing what we do, which is to, uh, we live in different places. Connor lives in California. I live in New Hampshire. Um, So we record over the internet. We've done that forever. We actually switch coasts at some point. Um, You know, we used to use Skype, um, we use a couple of programs. Uh, currently, we're on something called Riverside FM. Um, it can do video, but uh, you can also just record audio. And what that does is it records a track from each computer separately and uploads them. And it actually it aligns them uh, digitally because in the old days, if you tried to do that, like they wouldn't ever quite line up. Um, but that way, you don't have a file that is um, 
affected by bandwidth or if somebody drops out or gets it's we, a local we recording say, yeah yeah we always say get, get robotty um you've all been on calls where you heard somebody get robotty and that was sort of the death knell for us for a long time um and then besides that you're just talking about a mic and some headphones really i mean that and, and a computer obviously um it, as far as like equipment um the a mic that blocks out people's dogs is also helpful <laughs> but i don't know if that <laughs> Like my kids are getting home from school. This is a bad time for me. I wouldn't record now normally. Um, anyway, uh, you know, you don't want to sound like you're talking inside an empty closet. So there's a lot of stuff you can get. You can spend $500 on a mic. You can probably get a pretty good uh, USB snowball mic or whatever's the, the standard now for 50 bucks. And you kind of go with that. Over the years, our setups have gotten a little more uh, high quality, but not much. You know, I use a, um, I use a digital interface. Um, which is basically a device that USB plugs into the computer. I have a Scarlett Solo. Um, people use them to make music a lot. And in that, I have, um, uh, I forget what kind of mic this is. <laughs> Audio Technica 3. I knew when I bought it. Um, but, you know, like it's a, it's a good kind of recording mic. You'll see this one on every time you see like a radio announcer. Um, I've been watching news radio. They used it on that. Um, and I have that basically plugged straight into the interface. Um, and then when you go to Riverside and you select your sources the same way that you would on Teams or Zoom or whatever, you know, that's that's my source, my in and out. I plug a set of headphones into it um, and that's it. We're kind of off. Yeah. And the thing I'm is, a similar you, setup. You don't need like Josh and I have higher and stuff. We've been in this a long time. Um, we've been upgrading throughout the years. But for years, you know, we did a sh we did the show. I'm <laughs> sorry. It's all squished. Uh, we did a show with a Yeti mic, which you can get from Blue, which is not that expensive and i still use this when i travel like i'll bring this you know it folds up i bring it in my suitcase so if i'm doing the show from somewhere else and it's perfectly good microphone um you don't need to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars no. on, a, on a on a professional quality mic this is a good prosumer and lots of shows use these lots of our guests who come on have oh. one of these and people hey, use this and for work tip. now yeah you talked into this part do not point it at you. That is wrong. If you see people doing that as a mistake, <laughs> it drives me insane. But it's, it doesn't require that... much. And, and we edit on free software uh, called Audacity, although I, I I think I paid for the last version because I had a thing I wanted. But you can ulti you can use it for free. Um, and then hosts, there's tons and tons of hosts that um, don't cost all that much. You you can get into, into the game for relatively little. You know, so I just want to, I want to. Make sure I clarify. When you say host, you're talking about a podcast host, right? So correct. Yeah, someone's got to host you your are, show. You are recording honest, your files. I don't know that I can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are department. <laughs> there are things like you Libsyn or Podbean yeah. or mm -hmm. things, and just so people know, they you upload there and then they shoot them out to like your Apple Podcasts, right? And uh, I'll, Spotify. We'll drill it down even a little more. Um, when you're talking about editing. Um, we use a program called Audacity. Pretty much anybody who has a Mac has GarageBand. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. I'm sure you could Google it and find a thousand things. Audacity is probably quite old. Uh, it's been around forever as sort of freeware, but we know exactly what it does and it works great. Um, so you, you edit your show uh, and at the end you output uh, an MP3. Um, you know, our hour long show is 50 megs or so. So we sort of know about how big that is. And then you would, yeah, you'd, if you had a service, you'd upload that file to the service. Um, and then it kind of, uh, <laughs> see, this is the part I don't know. It makes an RSS feed and people who have subscribed to get it downloaded to them. But I mean, literally you have an MP3 file at the end of the day. It's, it's not super complicated. And I would just, in terms of equipment and sound, I think one of the things that we always did very well that I think helped us in terms of the, there was, we talked about the point of view, everything is that we were concerned with the fact that it sounded listenable. It, we, we, we have, like I said, we have somewhat of a background in production. So we kind of knew, oh, if you talk against a wall and it bounces off of here, it sounds terrible. You don't want that echoey sound. You, you know, I don't, we don't do a lot of post-production. Um, we use we use this is the greatest tool of all time we've been using it since we started there's a little freeware app and i think it's still available it went away for a while called levelator and levelator is you take um the raw file um for us uh, we use a wave file and you literally drop it into the window and it spits something out and it normalizes the audio all the way through and then i take connor's file and i do the same thing so then when i drop those both into the editing software we are already at the correct levels nothing's peaking nothing's not being heard it sounds a thousand percent natural it is free everybody should use it there's fancier ways to do it but they never work as well 
by that, I mean, just so your level, your audio level. So whether you're louder yeah. or softer than somebody, it basically makes it all sound mm -hmm. the same. Yeah, and it still keeps so, it still keeps peaks and valleys in terms of like yeah. you get more excited, but it, it 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 brings everything in. You know, a raw file. I might get real quiet at the moment, and then you can't barely hear me. But then I might get really loud. The, the level editor will sort of bring everything into a zone that's very similar. Yeah, and make it uh, I think better. if you. Visually, the way that it looks is like if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever seen like a, the, a visual file of a recorded audio track, there's sort of peaks and valleys as it goes through it like this. And if Connor and I were just use our regular sort of raw, you know, mine is always like, it's tiny and his is up here like this. And at the end, they both look identical. They have the same peaks and, and, and it's, it's just the simplest way to make sure everything sounds consistent and um, everybody should use that. Uh, and I just, I mean, yes, I just want to echo just the idea of using a microphone. Cause I, if a podcast now sounds like it was recorded in a conference room, I just, yeah, I, I don't even listen. I can't. It's just... the most important thing. And also it's so much Unless easier. You're famous. It's so much easier now because pre pandemic, you know, no one, not everyone now has like a microphone in their house. Yeah. Not everyone, mm -hmm. but like almost everyone I talk to in a meeting is on some sort of microphone, whether it's a headset mic or something because of working from home. And so you've already got half the equipment now because you're already doing using it for work. And when you're recording, so how long do you record? And then when you shrink it down, when you're editing, are you just taking out like ums and ahs or things you might have said, like answers. how finely tuning? So what's sort of the, <laughs> the, the work ratio between you guys record once a week, and I imagine that is a longer than an hour, and then you bring it down to an hour, or is uh, it pretty tight? Not much. So okay. again, we're talking we about almost work. 20 we years of repetition. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I, like, uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, there's there's an answer to that. So Josh and I just have yes. two different philosophies on this. So when we record the raw files, usually any, we'll just say around an hour 20. That's usually what it is because we'll babble on about stuff. Um, when I edit it, I edit pretty pretty heavily. And so I, I almost always take about 10 minutes out in the edit. And that's hardly ever any actual meaningful discussion. It's mostly ums and uhs and long pauses and verbal st stutter steps and so someone starts a sentence stops in the middle and restarts it i usually cut the whole like i usually cut about 10 minutes out of the out of the raw file um and that will take me a se several hours to do that to, to do like a heavy edit on the show but i like doing I also, it. it's creative i also do that i probably don't do it as ruthlessly but like i know what an um looks like in a waveform now yeah. so i try to take those out we both like th this is true like we both make sure we listen through the entire thing like there's nothing that goes so that there's not a screw up and you something that you didn't want to say went out over there and that happened one time and that's a lesson learned <laughs> um you know but but you know right now i'm saying but but you know i yeah. um I don't edit it heavily, but if it sounds like it's going to be annoying, we can take those things out as long as it sounds natural. It's not a crazy amount of editing because we're having a conversation. We have a rundown. We're not moving things around. Um, but it's also not, we, we don't just hit stop funny. and then send off to our, our distributor. So like it's, there is a, there's a time between, you know, finishing the show and there's several hours until it's finally done. It's so a one hour show. And I just checked, we're averaging about an hour, one hour, nine minutes this year on the show. So one hour, nine minute show for me, when you take, well, taking out reading the books, cause we have to read all the books for the show. We'll take all that out. The actual comics got out of, come out every Tuesday and Wednesday. And we each read usually between 15 or 20 or more a week. Which yeah, so we'll take out that bit, which we were required. Just, just putting the script together, recording, editing, and doing all the post edit, like making a little clip for Instagram and doing all that stuff. You know, we it probably is for me hours? Five, five hours because I do a little bit more. I just spend a lot of time editing it, but probably about five hours, three to five hours for a one hour show is about what we look at. Okay. And just to be, just to, while we're on this tactical bit, so you script out your show ahead of time. And that's probably because you have a lot of comics that you're covering, but you're not just going in going like, oh, hey, what do we want to talk about today? Well, that, that's the evolution of the show that Josh talked about is that. Um, if you go back and listen to the old shows, and I don't really recommend it, and and we weren't worried about fidelity back then. I, I think I talked into the monitor microphone in the first episode. Um, in the old days, we would just show up, and it, that's how it was. We would just start talking, and then one of us would say, well, I want to talk about Batman now. Um, we eventually started putting just a list of the books we want to talk about in a row, and that has grown and grown to the point now where, and again, Josh talked about this before, we come from production josh and i both worked in television 
we sort of formatted the script like a TV script where we have different blocks and um, we have the copy that's the same in the script. So like the opening of the show, we still have that in the script. And we have then the list of the books with the creative teams on them, which we didn't add till fairly recently in the run of the show because we would we were talking about a book and be like, wait, who drew this again? Now it's as all we, on the script. So as we, we to... stumbled into middle age, uh, it turned out there were a lot more. Uh, it was um it was that guy. What was that guy? <laughs> so that's all so the Connor's script like, now. We have to put the creative team, and I was like, I don't want to, but now it's totally the right thing to do. And they add read like everything that we read that's not just talking is in the script. And the you know um, the the plugs and every everything that goes into the making of the script. And the script is you know in a, just in a text file, and you put that together. And you know the the people on the show work together to figure out what books talk to talk about in what order. We have a long segment at the top, then an ad break, and then a shorter segment. We talk about the books for a short amount of time, and then we read you know listener mail. And so all that stuff goes into the script, and that takes you know not not too long to put together. But you've got to put it all together. You got to gather all the information. It takes about half an hour. To okay. Put it all together. That is super useful. Thank you. I want to move on to something that's probably on people's mind, which is money, right? People hear ads on things. Um, you're on Patreon. I just let's just what are realistic expectations for a podcast starting out in terms of money? And the answer can be there are none, right? You know what I mean? Like what did, what should people have going in understanding? Like Happiness comes from setting proper expectations. What are those expectations people should have around money? Well, Josh and I are coming to you from our various yachts. Um, <laughs> uh, no, you, you should have zero expectation. I mean, I agree, great Wi-Fi on the yacht. Um, uh, you, you can't be doing podcasts for money. And I think what we saw this year is even the big podcasts are, are, are realizing that the that there isn't as much money in podcasting as they thought. I'm talking about the big brands and the big celebrities. There are some those uh joe rogan is fine like there's there's like there's like a there, there, there's the cream and there's you know justin bateman and will arnett are making lots of money but for the most part there isn't as much money in podcasting as you might think did you just say justin bateman i did that was wrong that's yeah jason that's almost his sister his sister was almost on the show <laughs> you mash them yeah, together true. that was that old, old man brain you were talking about um yep and uh so we make a little bit of money doing the show we have full-time jobs we used to do this full-time uh that was back when we had a um video show that had a distributor distributor that paid us for per episode and then we got required by a, a tech company that for a couple of years that paid us a salary to do the show as, as well as other things for them um but for the most part we it's lost never been, everyone money <laughs> for the, but for the most part it's never been more than than a um a nice extra bit of money and we're sure. and we're it's quite a, successful. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I actually refer to it as sort of like this would be the equivalent of me driving an Uber on the weekends. It's it's kind of that. And and that that wasn't our goal to sort of bring in money until you know we've been doing the show for a while and like we had people reach out like we want to average. This is early, so we're talking two thousand six seven. You know, a comic shop or a service had been like, hey, you can you do? It? And we're like, okay, sure. And it was like a couple hundred bucks, and we'd be fine. When we went professional. Um, you know, we were getting revenue in from um, basically the production company who would, who were paying us to do the show. Um, and they were ads that came with that. And then we, we kind of realized we were, we were, there was a certain point where we had nobody paying for us to do it anymore. And we are also running a website sort of full-time too. So there was a whole other media. And we had a staff. Of, yeah. Um, and so we got some ads and we pushed where we could. Our audience has never been so small that there was no, not never, but um, that, that there's never been, we've always been able to get something, but it was never huge. You know, it was, uh, you know, in the multiple tens of thousands, you know, it's like we weren't going to live on this. Um, and the other thing that we did, um, and this is before Patreon, um, is that we had, we set up a membership program. We basically set up a PayPal link and we, made our own like NPR membership kind of thing. Um, and then the sort of diehard listeners who came, like they helped support us um, really like pretty surprisingly, um, you know, before there was a framework for it, before there was Patreon and we moved over into Patreon at some point just because uh, it seemed to make more sense. Um, but, it, but like that all comes from, so that's a big part of it, by the way, it's not just like ads. Um, 
and now you have things like Patreon. There's probably others. Um, and we have affiliate but, links and we have right. things like that. But yeah. yeah, there's like little drips and drabs. Of, but, but really so much of that comes from that sort of connection um, with our um, listeners. You know, Chris, you said I've been listening for a thousand years. We have people like we're a part of their lives and it is vice versa too. But, yeah. and we, we make that pitch is like, you know, we, we do need to pay for things. Um, and we are adults with lives and, there has to be some sort of it's very much helps that there's some sort of return for us at this point of money for value time yeah it's it's two things it's the bills it does cost in the low five figures to run ifanboy just the hmm. um the costs we have uh hosting fees from our website and the, it, at the end of the year it costs in the low five figures to pit to run ifanboy so we want to recoup that and we're not 27 anymore we have wives and Josh has kids and jobs and we have and every hour I spent doing the show every hour hours I spent editing is an hour I'm not spending with my family so we we want to it's it's a it's a way of making that time worth it if we were getting zero back it would be harder to justify the hours spent not with our family so that it's not it's never we're never doing this to retire we're never going to retire on a fanboy but we we just get a little bit back for the time and away it, from it helps. the rest of our lives. And it helps. It definitely it, helps. It helps a lot. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it definitely, you know, is a, if I have to, you know, we have to justify again to our spouses, like, why are you doing all this? Well, you know, this this helps, you know, pay for the kids at Christmas and to do, you know, again, it's not a ton of money, but it's enough that it makes a little bit of a difference. But I also don't think that that's our main goal. Like, you kind of said, we have fun. that meeting. No, like, we have that meeting every year. Like, is this still fun? And yeah. it's like, yep. Now, listen. If we were paying for all in our pocket, it might not be as much fun, <laughs> but that helps it make it fun. Well, I wonder if you can share like when, what's sort of the baseline you would need for an advertiser to even pay attention to who you are or like an ad network? Do you know this answer, Connor? I don't. Uh, so our third partner, Ron, handles most of these, the ad stuff. So it's, that's more of a question for him. I, I know that our, so we're, we're on a, we're on a hosting company called Megaphone. That, that's okay. who hosts our show, and they're owned by, I think they're owned by Spotify. They're owned by Spotify now. Um, and so what they do is they go through all their shows, and then they they will sell ads for you. Like some ads we have on the show that we we've, we've sold ourselves, like people come right. to us directly, and some most of the pre recorded ones you hear before the show, um, but sometimes during the show is stuff that the host has sold against our um, our show. So. So we, and, and it's more they come up, say, hey, do you, want, do you want to do these ads? We say yes, no, yes, no, yes, and that's how. That and works. they'll match up your your you know your uh, average audience with you know your keywords or whatever it is, and sort of say, oh, this demographic probably listens to that. And so you know we did, um, we did Mac Weldon underwear ads for years, and people kept coming back. But that was We'd through been... us, not through the host. Yeah, no, I I, I get it. So uh, you know, there's others like that, and it, it tends to be you know stuff that appeals to men. <laughs> the middle age. Well, sure. Um, I mean, you got an audience and a demographic, yeah. right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I think we can say at least you probably need to be in the tens, if not the hundreds of thousands of downloads in order to uh, attract the attention of a, no, I wouldn't say that's network. necessarily true. Really? Okay. Um, well, maybe, maybe for the, maybe monthly downloads uh, for sure. Uh, yeah. But the thing with podcast advertising is that it's more of a long tail for the advertisers. Like they, they will try to spread out. And look, if you're if you're doing a show and you've got 50 downloads, you're probably not going to get any advertising uh, interest. If you've got a show that's got a thousand downloads, you're probably not going to get much advertising interest. But you've got to be in the thousands, probably. And if they can, if you're on a network that can package that with other shows, and then they can sell that to an advertiser mm -hmm. and say you will be on these 12 shows, that'll equal this many downloads, and you might get advertising revenue through that. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but um, but also the the more shows we do a month is the more downloads that sort of contributes to that as opposed to each episode um being like this many people listening i know that so like if we yeah they, they tend to look like connor said we do downloads. six if we do seven eight it's easier for us and we we do better got it i think got it now so i want to shift the money talk over now to patreon right just and again this is just sort of for people who are thinking of just starting out patreon people can go and so like you have subscribers i'm a subscriber i pay a certain amount of money and then you get access to do we give you a superpower oh yeah i was yeah, long did. i was a long yeah. long time ago yeah. i think like 2017 
Uh, I was. I've done so many. I think I don't Ron remember. gave me mine. It was like oh, being wow. able. I was like a human triple A or something. Being able to. Uh, the fact that I remember it, but yeah, it was. Uh, you should. I, believe I, mean, I was good. like the human triple A. I could find. I could navigate anywhere or something like a triptych. Oh, a living. I thought you're a small battery. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> he could only. He could, but he could only power remote controls. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't. And he's uh, never yeah. around when you need one. <laughs> uh. Yeah. So, but so on Patreon, tell people what it's like working on Patreon and just what are some things they should know if that's an avenue that they're looking to explore. Well, you should only explore it if you have an audience. Um, you know, it's like what comes first, the chicken or the egg is, is you can't have a Patreon without listeners. I mean, you can set it up, but, um, and there's, ten, I think there is totally something the idea that if you go to somebody like you've never heard it and you go to somebody's Patreon page and they have like five listeners, you're like, oh, I, don't, I mean, unless you love it, that yeah. might make them sort of back away the other way. So in terms of chicken or the egg, I, I don't know which I, I think you need to have the egg. So like work longer on sort of getting some people's attention before you sort of rush out the please pay me part. Um, yeah, I think people I also just know want that, to see a track record of a show coming out before they yeah, start. That's, yeah, that consistency yeah. that we talked about for us is probably – and again, sorry, but a lot of this stuff like has happened, and I have to think about it in retrospect because we've just sort of been working at it for so long. But um, yeah, I think if it was like a new show and you were immediately to throw a Patreon up, you, you might be putting the cart before be, the horse a little bit. Yeah, and then it just becomes community management. That's what we've been doing our entire yeah. you know, entire iFanboy careers. You know, In the beginning, we had a you – know, our our – our distributor of the video show. We had a forum that was really popular. Then we had people on the website and then it was uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And we've been managing community in some way or fashion, the, our entire history of doing this. So then it just becomes a different community to manage where it's more focused. And it's, it's more of the super fan, the, the super user is your patron. And we, um, we, we made a promise. We would never put the show behind a paywall um we we would never create well we, no we never put the show their main show behind a paywall that doesn't necessarily mean we would never do a show for the patrons only we would we'd never discuss that but i don't think we would rule it we out do the hangout right so we we try to create things that are fun for the patrons so we have a monthly hangout where we jump on uh, a zoom like product and hang out with them for an hour <laughs> um we use Streamyard, which is a streaming service that streams to our youtube page, page that's where we do it um, so we do that for them once. It's actually more than an hour. We ended up doing about three hours, but we do that once a month. We have a Discord that is patrons only. You can only get the access to the Discord if you're a patron. So, um, and that's actually a certain level of patronage. Uh, so we have that community. That's great. I'm on there all day long. It's a very active community. Um, and then we uh, is there anything else that's patron only? And then they have their own merchandise. They get they get tons of merchandise. Yeah. That they can they can get if only as patrons. So we try to make so things worth it. Beyond, over and beyond what Josh said is ultimately we hope people support us because they enjoy the show, not because they get a t-shirt, uh, and I, which is I think great. To, it's a bonus for me. And I think the key to all of that um, is that – like I think that we understand that most of our people who are listening at this point – and new people do come on and come and go, um, but it has a lot to do with sort of our personality, you know, like the, like the greater our personality. And so to me, it's always important that all of those things that we do – are geared towards, you know, being in step with the image that we have of ourselves on the show, which is, by the way, not thought out. It's literally ourselves. It's just that that seems to have worked out pretty well. So when he talks about having, you know, a Discord community, like, you know, we're on there. We chat with people. We're we're part of it. Um, you know, the like the things that we put out, the um, sorry, like Instagram posts or something like that, are very much. And this is probably why we don't have a gigantic audience is they're very much like in our brand, in our sort of style and voice, as opposed to wide ranging and trying to sort of reach out to the giant. Like we understand the pocket that we fit in to a certain extent. Um, and to be outside of it would be sort of disingenuous. And so like we're like, not on it, TikTok. It, yeah. Because like that it, doesn't it, wouldn't be that's just not <laughs> we're in our late 40s. It doesn't, wouldn't make any sense. You can tell by how he said TikTok that it <laughs> wouldn't work because we're not on TikTok, like right. like <laughs> like it's it, to me it's i i think about it very like the things that we do have to be genuine and sincere 
and and authentic to ourselves. God, which I hated saying any of that out loud. But it's no, still... no, 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 no. I'm going to come push back on you because okay, you said it. You said it earlier. Like the whole thing has been about sincerity and authenticity from the yes. very beginning. Like we have succeeded. I, I think from I just the beginning, mean how those words are used in the culture I understand. now. Okay. But we've succeeded in any way because we have been, I think, authentic to ourselves and to our tastes and our likes and and our and our friendships and everything we've done is try to be sincere and authentic to that yes. philosophy. And so and and it, like the, in the background of everything is this whole time, this whole time, and we've actively discussed this, and we haven't in a while, but it still exists. Is that the idea is that the comic book, um, as it exists, especially in America, as a sort of a weekly release things is this wonderful form of storytelling that most people don't really know about or understand. And we have sort of devoted all this time to understanding it. And the more that you do that, the more you appreciate it. And that is the thing we're, we're not here to make fun of stuff. We're trying to find what's good about comics. And we can say, you know, oh, this book we read was great. Here's why and sort of describe it. And then the people listening will go, oh, that, that's a great thing. I would have never known about that. And that becomes a really valuable part of their lives because it's a really valuable part of our lives in that way. And so that is like at the center of every single thing that we do is just like this love of this art form, yeah. um, which is a really sort of, you know, the, the reputation is it's sort of pop art and it's it's transitory and it's for, you know, it's, it hasn't been for kids for a long time, but still that it's less than a novel. It's less than a movie. And it's literally just a way to tell a story. Um, and it's a very specific way to tell a story. And when you sort of the more you understand it, the better it gets. You know, like when you understand that there is this guy named Jack Kirby and he drew all these amazing images that are the center of every single pop culture mega property you know about today almost you know that that's that's this like connective tissue to everything and then you understand why he was great and the fact that i'm talking about right it still gets me excited i get so excited to tell <laughs> have you heard the good news about jack kirby like, <laughs> and i mean it um and i i you know I know that we were on the right. I know that we've been on the right track because people. See, that would be a good TikTok it. of sending you around people's houses and asking them the question. Just knock on them <laughs> with short sleeve and a tie, <laughs> um, you know. But I and I also know like we've met a lot of comics pros in our years, and and to have those folks say to us, it's still one of the greatest things I've ever heard. Was um, uh, one of the guys who is very successful in comics, and they moved on to other stuff, and you know, have said like, we know that when you criticize the work that we did it's not coming from a bad place and it's worth listening to like that was like, Oh, cause I hate criticizing stuff because I know uh, comics have this tiny audience really. I mean, they used to sell millions of copies. Now if a comic book sells a hundred thousand copies, it's a huge breakout hit. And so anybody who puts in the work and effort and time to make a comic book um, has had to work really hard. These folks work harder than any of like they're bent over a table, they're drawing, they're scrimping for their, their living in most cases, you know, so you have to respect that. Like, First and foremost, like, so anyway, I, I, the point is like, this is what we're about. This is in the background of everything you do. That is hopefully that authenticity. Um, and that's something that people relate to. Awesome. I just well, spun out. If the no, that's okay. That no, out. look, I think that that's really important, right? Like, I think that that it's, is, it is, you've been doing this for decades and you have a loyal following because you are true to sort of every like. Every time he says decades, I want to slap him. I, no, look, <laughs> as someone who is older than both of you I, I think i think it's okay uh yeah, but look how cool your gray tips were. Oh, you look oh, you yeah. look good hey thank it's you nice. thank you it's this yes Chris that's, has a that's terrific head of hair <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what we were i'm changing it we're hair talk oh, welcome back uh I'm out. You're done. Today, connor's gonna storm off <laughs> today <laughs> Uh, hey, so we got one question for the audience. I want to remind yep. people that, uh, that if they want to uh, type in a question, they can. Before we wrap up here, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, this is someone who obviously knows uh, y'all. Uh, Jonathan writes, I love the show and listening every week. Y'all got me back into reading weekly books again. When are y'all, the, all these y'alls are his, just so you know. Okay. Uh, when are y'all going to start adding an ER episode to the rundown? <laughs> don't, don't threaten us with a good time. Uh... <laughs> Well, I think the one thing that we didn't mention is that in addition to the iFanboy podcast, for a while you did a Goodfellas Minute podcast. Oh, right. Yeah. Forgot about where that. Where you literally broke down the movie that Godfellas minute by minute. And that so, was that is yeah. not a short movie. So no, the, the and we also had another that, podcast called Murmur. We had yeah. we've had several podcasts over the years. Um when we had just a the best website. at talking about comics, it turns out. Um there was a there was a show uh friends of mine did 
called Star Wars Minute. And I don't know if they were the first, not maybe not the first to do it, but the first to do it and get an audience. And they went through Star Wars every five days a week. They did one every day. They did one minute of Star Wars and they sort of finished. And the whole time that was going on, we were like, that's kind of that's a brilliant idea. And like, what would we do when we decided let's try doing uh, Goodfellas? We were the second one. There are hundreds now, hundreds, yeah. if not more. Well, I think we were third because um, they were second. There was a show before them that didn't catch on. But we, the big we were, Lebowski one. I think we were the third by minute and by minute, meaning you just talk about one minute of the movie. Mm-hmm. So you watch you watch one. It's like from this second to this second, and you just discuss that minute, and you do that for however long. And they're still doing it. They're very successful, the Star Wars yes. Minute guys. But um, so we did Goodfellas because our, uh, me and Josh and our co-host Ron, we are all we all love the movie. We're big Scorsese fans. We're big true crime fans. Like it hit all of our Venn diagrams. There were like eight of them, and they all centered on Goodfellas. And so we did that, and it was a lot of fun. It actually made our I fanboy show better, I think, ultimately because yes. we it had was to do so different... much work. It was so much work. It was a different kind it was of so show. much work. That that year we did it nearly killed me because we we were doing all of our fanboy shows plus a daily Goodfellas minute show, and jobs and family. And we we had guests on that one. We don't have guests on our normal show other than the sort of bi monthly interview show. So we had to like I think every other week we'd have somebody come on and yeah. Oh man, I'm so week. proud of that though. It's so it was good. great. Thank you. Yeah, it we, we it, it made us looser I think because we had been we had been doing our fanboy for so long we sort of fallen into a. Uh, structure and doing Goodfellas in a non-structured format made us sort of looser in doing the uh, the regular show. It, it helped. Every show helped. Every show was a learning experience, um, but that was fun. And then the <laughs> ER question is sort of related to our our media explode show, which we do monthly, which we talk about non comics media, which I mentioned at the top. Um, you know, we all love ER, and we always joke about doing an ER minute, which would take. We, we figured out would take us what until we were uh, seventy five years old to it do. It would be ER. a long time. Like if you did. <laughs> yeah. Like if we wouldn't all necessarily live week. through it. Yeah, <laughs> it would. It would. It would be Mark until we were in our seventies. Well, yeah, that so. which leads to the question that has come up every time we've traveled somewhere: if one of us uh, is killed or dies on this trip through tragic misfortune, do you do we still have to do the show? And the answer is always like, yeah, I think you do. Um, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, but we've talked about it a lot. Well, you had the uh, appendectomy. You almost died doing having that. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I'm glad you are all surviving and thriving. Before we go, uh, I just want to ask one thing for people. Um, if you could give just quickly, what's a podcast you, you really enjoy that you think that you just like listening to, but you also think might be sort of instructive in in any kind of way, whether it it sounds good, the host is good, it's an interesting topic, right? Like for somebody who's just starting at a podcast, other than checking out iFanboy. Sure. Um well, the what's a, what's one that they should listen to? May I throw just a slight curveball into that before we get sure. to that? I know I know that. So what Open Water is doing and, and the and the and the and the mission it has, and the, this, this discussion sort of about how to use podcasting is sort of a way to help your career possibly or build your brand. I actually thought about it. I did know someone who, um, and this ties back into Josh's thing in the beginning, which is do what you are passionate about. Is I, I helped a friend of mine's husband figure out a podcast because he was in real estate and so he made a real estate podcast hmm. and it wasn't meant to be big it wasn't meant for it was just meant for his clients to be able to hear about what was so like if you are looking to do to as podcasting as a way to sort of help your next stage of your career is like pick what you know and are good at start doing a show about that and then you can sort of you know through linkedin or other places you can sort of bring you know hopefully people find it and and that's a way to help sort of you know bon- brush up on your bona fides, you know, and help become more, sort of an expert in the field. That's sort of a way you can use podcasting for that. But that is a side uh, point to your question, which is... Uh, well, I think me. that that's that's really interesting just to inter- real quick, because I don't think people would think. I would never have thought about a real estate podcast. But if you have, like, I live on an island, and yeah. that's a great idea because it's a contained geographic area, and you could, you know, easily have one of the, of the local real estate scene, and you, yeah. there's enough content that changes every week. That's I think it's an interesting way of thinking about how you would approach a podcast, right? There's like an unlimited it's not amount just... of of topics. It doesn't have to be entertainment based. There's yeah. an unlimited amount of business podcasts. And if you're an expert, if you've been doing something for 30 years, um, you know, do a show about that. Or like you said, if, like Chris's idea of having a really specific, you know, audience. You know, if you just want to have a podcast about the real estate in that area and you can get people in the area to know about it, that's a successful podcast. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to do it. It doesn't have to be about 
entertainment. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a million listeners to be a successful podcast. You can, you can have a goal. And if you meet, like for my friend's husband's podcast, it was the first clients. If his clients listen, that's successful. If I yeah. listen, I don't have to listen to it because I'm not one of those clients. Um, I'm looking, I was looking at Also, my, he'd oh, make terrible real estate decisions. I would. <laughs> Just... I keep buying warehouses. Uh, <laughs> I um I'm looking at my podcast. I'm not just I'm not not paying attention. I can I can uh, I can sort of go on this. Uh, so the, I I never listen to shows like ours, which is like people talking about things for the most part. Um, except recently, and these are famous people, and I've mentioned that a lot. But one of the things that changed in podcasting in our years is that famous people started to do it, and corporations started to do it. So now when I say we're the biggest comic book podcast, I say we're the biggest independent comic book podcast. You know, right? Like, who are not sponsored by with everybody else or aren't involved with a famous person because fame is sort of the instant marketing will get people to listen to it. Um, so the fact that I'm about to say this is wrong, but here we are. Um, the Strike Force Five podcast, which came out um, from the the five late night hosts um, so during good. the strike. Yeah, it was so good. And it wasn't good because those guys were famous. That's why people managed to turn it on and listen to it. But it was five people who were very funny, very clever and genuinely like to be with each other and make make each other laugh. And they told stories and they were being very, um, you know, when you're on a show on, on TV, you are doing a character to some extent all the time. You cannot be fully yourself. And I felt when I was watching that show, I was like, this feels like them talking to each other. Like, and at times I felt like they forgot that they were on mic and putting on a show. And it just felt entirely authentic and true. And I really loved that about it. Um, and it was legitimately and, funny. Like I laughed yeah. out yes. loud yeah. multiple times, like Constantly. having to stop the podcast because I wasn't like, yeah. I was just laughing so much. But they were only trying to make each other laugh. And it's, yeah. we do the same thing on our show. Like uh, when when Ron used to be on our show, my only goal on that show, I like to say smart things or whatever. But if I can make him laugh, usually it was a good show. Um, and Connor's harder, so I have to work harder at it. <laughs> um, but uh, so there's that one. Um, I also like really specific um, – I, I, I like produce things like documentary kind of stuff because I'm interested in it, but this is, that's a tougher ask for somebody sort of doing it on their own first time or whatever. Um, there's a show called the trap set. Um, and it's this sort of um, working drummer. Um, Christ, I don't remember his name, Joe something. Uh, and he just was interviewing drummers sort of a various fame level and they would talk and I'm not a drummer. Well, I wasn't then I'm learning. Um, no, but he, he would interview drummers from, you know, from bands that you maybe heard of or indie drums, sometimes you get somebody really big on and they would talk about techniques and careers and something. I'm very into music and I'm not, uh, like I said, I'm not a drummer, but I love that show because it was so, it's the same thing. It was so authentic. It was two people really interested in some niche thing, you know, and they would talk about touring or they would talk about setting up their kits and you just learned about this whole other thing that was inside something I was already interested in. Um, but that other side of it. And again, this was just like two people connecting. Like it was really great. And it wasn't the same thing as like a celebrity interview. Um, although, you know, like Marin does that better than anybody, but, um, or did I stopped listening a while ago? Um, but it was, it was so niche and specific. Um, yeah. I thought that was a great show. Um, That's cause it was, yeah, he, he wasn't trying to get an audience. He was trying to have a great conversation. Yeah. Connor, gonna, anything in your Yeah, I'm going to give you two, two okay. um, I mean, I can give you several options. I'm listening to more now than I ever did, which is interesting. Um, but two, on two different sides of the spectrum. So one super produced and one very indie. So on the super produced side, I've been a big fan. This is a relatively new show. And this is uh, Talking Pictures produced by uh, uh, TCM and Max. So it's a, from big brands. But it's uh, Ben Mankiewicz, one of the TCM hosts, interviewing film directors. And if you're a film buff like I am, it, it was a fascinating podcast where he would talk about, you know, their influences and what made them excited about film and why they made certain decisions in movies. And, you know, he talks to uh, Nancy Myers and Steven Stoderberg and Mel Brooks and even Bill Hader, uh, Patty Jenkins, um, Alexander Payne. So it was like if you if you're a film person like I am, this is a really terrific interview podcast. But then. On the other end of the spectrum is our buddy Tom Caters does Tom versus comics. And he started doing it again for their through their Patreon and it goes out for everybody. Um, this is a great example of just one guy at a microphone who happens to be very funny and entertaining, just talking for 20 minutes and making a really entertaining show as he reads a comic. He doesn't read it, but he goes through the story for you. And it's just like the one the one show has a staff, they have a production company, they, you know, there's like a whole bunch of people behind it. The other show is just one guy. And a microphone. Who is an and accountant? He's not anymore. And he has a copywriter for advertising. Either way, you know, what I mean, like he was like, an accountant. This isn't when he like started. his thing. 
Yeah. So like he was just a guy. I talked to Tom a, in a while. Has a passion, <laughs> and is and and realizes he has a skill, which was being funny. And he made a show with just him and a microphone. And it's very entertaining, and it's been he's been doing it for years. Um, and it's and because so, he loves old. He, he basically started off reading like old flash going through every issue of the Flash starting in the fifties, and he loves those old comic books and can sort of zoom in on what you know is interesting or entertaining about them. And he's he's really great at that. Um, it goes back like, to finding your hook. slice. Find your slice. Your hook mm -hmm. is that you know maybe it's a podcast about real estate and no, and maybe it's a podcast about old Flash comics. But you can just be a one person with a microphone. And as long as you do it well and practice, and by the way, we did practice episodes. We didn't just start putting a show out. We recorded a practice one just to see how it worked. Like I have no memory of that. Yeah, it was, it was probably as bad as the first episode of the show was. But, um, you know, ultimately just have fun doing it. That's the main thing. Just It's, it's about having fun, and that's what all you can really do. I'm, I'm going to give you a little tip because I think we weren't doing a good job with it, but we've been talking about being on your own or whatever. Connor and I talk to each other and we have to figure out the rhythm of each other. And so if you're doing a show with somebody else, like you, you've got to figure out what your rhythm is and how to not talk over each other and to take that other person's cues and sort of go in and out. And if you have an idea, you can't say it immediately. Like there's all these things that become second nature, which is again, a thing that I think we've gotten lucky to be good at, but through practice, through repetitions and things like that, but at least be conscious of it if you're going to do it with somebody else. Well, that is a great place to end. Thank you both, uh, Connor Kilpatrick and Josh Flanagan, co-hosts and co-creators of the iFanboy podcast. Uh, you can find it at iFanboy.com. Thank you, fellas, for being here today. I really appreciate it. This has been wonderful.